This episode is brought to you by Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. Want to advance your career or switch fields? An MBA from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business can help. Earn your degree from a top-ranked business school with a thought-provoking curriculum, one-on-one leadership coaching, support from experienced career counselors, and full-time online hybrid and accelerated MBA formats. Join the intelligent future. Visit cmu.edu slash Tepper to learn more. So the live touring and ticketing industry, the sky is the limit, despite anti-competitive allegations marrying the live industry. Let's dive into the characteristics of this various serious contender for the top spot for revenue generator in the music industry. The live touring and ticket business is back with a vengeance post-COVID-19 pandemic. However, not all is well in this very lucrative sector of the music industry as two promoters and venues and even search on jeans see their liability, legal and financial risks increasing in a world dominated by fans, satisfaction, safety and fair access to tickets. So how did um, the live and touring industry become the core revenue stream for artists? Before we delve into this, let's just have a look at the at at you know our core knowledge of the music industry. Well, the music industry and business has many facets, with each musical activity generating its own sources of revenues. So the first. Uh, a, a music industry income stream is the music publishing side, which mainly derives receipts from monetizing the copyright on the musical compositions and sound, song lyrics. So those income generated by publishing come by way of royalties on public performance rights collected by music collective rights management societies around the world from music users such as major TV networks, radio stations, pay cable services, digital service providers, websites, concert halls, the hotel industry, nightclubs, bars, theme parks, etc. Another income stream derived from publishing is our royalties on mechanical rights on public performance rights which are also called additional mechanical rights, deriving from TV, radio broadcasting, as well as internet broadcasting on sites such as Dailymotion, YouTube, and Vimeo, also collected by music collecting societies. The third income stream derived from music publishing is synchronization fees, paid to music composers and lyricists, as well as to the music publishers and sync agents for the licensing of copyright on musical compositions, and or lyrics, which are synchronized into video content such as advertisements, films or TV series, and other visual projects. And music publishing is also monetized by way of print licensing fees paid to music publishers to obtain the right to print, display, and publish the music notes and lyrics of a song on sheet music and scores, which are then sold to music performers who will perform the songs. The second ink stream is the sound recording side, which mainly derives income from monetizing neighboring rights on sound recordings, also called phonograms, songs, music tracks, by way of royalties collected by neighboring rights collecting societies around the world, from music users such as major TV networks, radio stations, pay cable services, websites, the hotel industry, nightclubs, bars, theme parks, etc. The Sound recording side is also monetized via streaming rights on sound recordings by way of streaming royalties paid by digital service providers such as Spotify, Deezer, Amazon Music to music performers and their music labels. And sound recording is also monetized via copyright on the master recordings by way of sync fees to music performers, so singers and session musicians, 
as well as two their music labels and sync agents for the licensing of the sound recordings, which are synchronized into video content such as commercials, films, TV programs, and other visual projects. Next to revenue streams derived from the previously mentioned copyright in the music compositions and lyrics, as well as copyright in the master recordings and neighboring rights, there is touring income. Touring revenues are generated by tickets bought by fans, music lovers, and teenage fans chaperones in order to have the privilege of watching a music performance live, either in a concert venue, a school, an arena, a stadium, a casino, or online on a streaming site. Indeed, most music performers model their careers on that of a concert performer in terms of both live and recorded performances. So touring is essential for performers to develop their craft, grow and sustain their audiences, help promote their record, stream and merchandising sales, and build their stature. For this reason, most non-legacy performers will schedule tours to coincide with the launch of a new record album release. Concert performers function through true business entities as opposed to being employees of a producer or promoter. They possess assets such as valuable names, trademarks, very expensive music, sound and lights equipments and musical instruments, and often copyrights on their songs, musical compositions or lyrics. They also employ numerous individuals such as agents, managers, supporting musicians and tour personnel. And if all goes well, they earn substantial touring income. Post COVID-19 pandemic and its string of excruciatingly long lockdowns, the live touring industry has come back with a vengeance with some performance tours single-handedly being recognized as contributing to a nation's or town's economy in the billions of US dollars or pounds sterling. And on this note, I refer you to the various articles published recently about the impact of Taylor Swift's last tour on the 2023 economy as a, as a whole, like apparently a, a contributing like billions of dollars or, or and millions of pounds. While most music performers, composers and lyricists complain about the paltry level of a stringing income, which is going to get even smaller for the vast majority of performers due to the implementation of Spotify's new 1000 play minimum policy, touring is increasingly seen as the way to make serious bucks in the music industry. Some industry analysts go as far as to say that touring is where musicians make most of their annual total income, dwarfing the revenue earned from streaming. Paul Starr, a service that monitors live performance touring statistics, reports that live concert sales for the 2023 worldwide top 100 tours were up 46% to 9.17 billion US dollars from 6.28 US billion US dollars the previous year. Average grosses were up a whopping 33.20% to 2.37 million US dollars per show from 1.54 US million US dollars two years ago in 2022. Attendance increases were less dramatic but still significant. Total ticket sales were up 18.40% from 59 million to 70 million. And average tickets per show were up 24.25% from 14,570 to 18,103. Average ticket prices increased 23.33% from 106 US dollars to 131 US dollars. So pretty steep increase here. So how is set up the live and touring ecosystem? Well, the key players in music touring are all have very specific roles. 
each one of our stakeholders has a very specific and important role to play in putting on a live show and or a tour. Unlike streaming technologies, which easily broadcast music tracks to billions of listeners worldwide at the pressing of a button, organizing a live show or a tour is difficult and requires a team of specialists. The first stakeholder in the live and touring ecosystem is, of course, the artists. Music performers are the driving force behind the event's overall success. In 2023, for example, the top performer was Taylor Swift, who set an all-time touring record with a one billion US dollars touring cross. I mean, one billion dollars. The music industry would be virtually non-existent if it weren't for artists who perform. Indeed, the live music sector sells tickets for the artists and their songs. The entire live event gets a lot of positive feedback from the audience if the performer performs well. Regardless of how much effort is put into making the uh, concert a reality, if the artist fails to live up to expectations on stage, it sabotages and undermines all of it. So the artists are key to the success of a live industry. Second stakeholder in the ecosystem of a live and touring industry are managers and tour managers. The management of performers will participate in route planning, assist the artist in selecting the touring brand, and act as a liaison between the artist's live performance and the rest of their professional life. The tour is in the hands of the artist's manager, who serves as the team's chief executive officer. Top performers management companies are Full Stop Management, Red Light Management, Rock Nation, Sutsco, and SB Projects, for example. So I'm quoting a lot of stakeholders here and making many references to other content on our website, crefovi.com and crefovi.fr. So don't hesitate to purchase a subscription, a yearly subscription to our restricted content so that you can have access to all these uh, uh, links and you are links and to, to, to either third party content or our content. Famous music managers include Paul McGuinness, who, who managed the rock band U2 from 1978 to 2013. Once the book has been set up, managers are responsible for ensuring it goes on without a hitch, ensuring that the booking agent is making the best possible deals and making the tour happen. The artist managers is in charge of coordinating and supervising the transportation of people and equipment, hiring and smooth functioning of crews, booking hotels and restaurants, collecting touring receipts while traveling, dealing with promoters, i.e. the people who hire the artist, rent a hall, advertise the events, etc., and resolving any issues that arise, such as missing equipment, improper advertising, dates that aren't selling well. Many of his responsibilities are transferred to a proper tour manager or a tour accountant for more well-known musicians. However, the artist's personal manager is ultimately liable and bears the burden of proof in case anything goes wrong during the tour. Keeping things moving smoothly on the road is the job of the tour manager. It is their job to ensure that everything is in order from the hotel reservations to the plane tickets to the bus schedules and to ensure that the artist and their entourage arrive at their destinations on time and with no problems. The tour manager must check the promoter's accounting settlement every night of the event and ensure that the collected money is deposited accurately. There is no tour without tour managers. They are what keeps it going. Third stakeholder in the live and touring ecosystem are record labels. Record companies in the 1960s and early 1970s supported and underwrote the costs of tours by their artists, 
but following the recession in the 1970s, and again during the labor retrenchment of the 1990s, and again since the tightening economic conditions besetting the industry during the financial crisis in 2008 to 2010, this practice has diminished considerably. In the wake of further record industry restructuring in response to declining sales of recording music in the past decade, many labels have begun to demand a participation in, in some or all of artists' concert touring, merchandising endorsement, publishing, and other entertainment-related income streams as part of 360 deals, so-called because the label seeks participation in the full 360 degrees of artist commercial activities. They also called multiple rights deals to help offset the risks of investments in record production and release. The major record labels, which represent the majority of music streamed and sold, making up as much as 80% of the music market or more, depending on the year, take the position that their marketing and release of an artist's recordings are a primary engine for the artist's success in and throughout all fields of the artist's management endeavors, including the artist's touring, fortunes, and as such, the record label should also participate directly as a partner slash investor, particularly in a period in which touring and associated merchandising rights may eclipse income generated from record sales. So now record labels will want to share in the touring income. And usually a lot of them, especially majors, major, major labels, all ask for 360 degree deals to artists. Where record labels, major and independents alike, may have once viewed tour support as unavoidable, if not indispensable, marketing cost of record sales, now the recording and its promotion are understood to be marketing vehicles for all artist entertainment industry related revenues, from which the labels uniformly seek a participation and depending on the status and leverage of the artist, the label may be willing to increase their support, financial or otherwise, for artists to agree to grant the label an economic participation in most, if not all, fields of the artist entertainment career, including tour income. Other than superstar tours, the reduction in tour support from record labels resulted in a downsizing of shows, i.e. the reducing of technical equipment, number of personnel, and other perks on the road. It also required performers to appear in smaller venues with lower costs and less risks in the event that they did not sell out. However, recognizing the promotional value of touring, especially since most music tours follow an, an album release, performers sought other ways to finance tours. And so this is where the fourth stakeholder of the music industry comes into the, the horizon, tour promoters. Promoters are responsible for securing the money for a tour and purchasing the tickets. They are the people who employ the artist for the night in each market. Top tour promoters are Live Nation, AEG Presents, or CISA, or the Grupo CIE, very strong in the South American market, Semel Concert Entertainment, which is a German a tour promoter. Concert marketing is a diverse field with a wide range of promoters to choose from. They may be local, regional, national, or worldwide, depending on how much of the country, region, or world they serve. Prom promoters reserve the space, which implies that they are responsible for paying the rent, even if no one turns up at the concert. They fund publicity for the event and they oversee its execution. After the previously mentioned decline in financial involvement and support from the record labels, some star performers opted to enter into a comprehensive tour agreement with a national promoter or even international promoter. 
such as Live Nation or AEG, that guarantees a minimum fee against a percentage of ticket sales and merchandising grosses, and in turn, assumes all of our production and venue arrangements, which likely will include the right to solicit tour sponsorship. So Madonna, for example, with her management company, Maverick Production, has entered various very lucrative promotion deals with Live Nation, which is the number one tour promoter in the world. And as you, I'm sure you know, she tours almost every year. Rights typically granted in such comprehensive tour agreements may include not only the right to solicit tour sponsorship, with the artist generally having the right to reasonably approve the identity of a sponsor, the right to preclude potential tour sponsors whose goods or services would conflict or compete with those of already existing artist sponsors or those who are inconsistent with the artist's identity or values, and any sponsor benefits or deliverables requested by a tour sponsor that require active participation by the artist, such as meet and greets, concert streamings, etc. They may also, those um, tour agreements, include the right to control the sales and allocations of all tickets, inventories, through all sales and distribution channels, the right to implement revenue maximizing services, including but not limited to first class seating, VIP packages, and the right to book private personal appearances, which are not advertised and for which tickets are not sold to the general public. In negotiating the concert tour agreement with the tour promoter, the artist must also arrive at terms to set aside and make available a sufficient number of preferred seats for members of the artist fan club and other VIP ticket sales endeavors. The insurance provisions of touring agreements are also the subject of extensive negotiation, whether the artist is a baby band, just undertaking a touring career, or an international superstar, obtaining at a minimum general liability insurance and at higher levels, non-appearance and tour cancellation insurance are critical considerations for the performer. Commonly, tour agreements provide that if any concert is cancelled by reason of a force majeure event, the artist and promoter will use their commercially reasonable efforts to reschedule such concerts to a mutually approved date or replace such concert with a mutually approved substitute contiguous to the current itinerary for the tour. Beyond that, if any cancelled concert cannot be rescheduled or replaced, then the promoter will generally not be required to make the per show guarantee payment for that concert, which should be covered by the artist's tour cancellation insurance. However, if any concert cancellation is due solely to the fault of the artist, then the artist is liable to the promoter for all direct, out-of-pocket, verified expenses directly related to the applicable cancelled concert, with the promoter generally required to use its commercially reasonable efforts to mitigate the resulting cost promptly after any such cancellation. Okay, so now let's move on to the fifth stakeholder in the live touring industry, who are the sponsors. While star performers may arrange commercial sponsorships, new and less famous performers are often left to find an angel or to self-finance their tours. With respect to such sponsorship, whether for an arena act or a new band touring small clubs, a corporate sponsor provides money to mount and finance the tour in exchange of a right to have its corporate logo or logo of its products included in the advertising or promotion of all the tour dates or perhaps to use the artist's music, name, trademarks and likeness in its independent advertising and promotion. For example, in 2012, Beyonce partnered with Pepsi for a $50 million deal in which Pepsi sponsored a variety of creative projects for Beyonce, including her tours, as well as promoting the singer's fifth studio album. Beyond this, the sponsor may agree to pay for advertisements, agree to purchase a guaranteed number of tickets at each venue, agree to pay a promotional fee in addition to costs. 
The sponsor may also elect to enter into a separate advertising agreement with the performer in which the performer may appear as a spokesperson for the company, or at least permit use of the artist to prove name, approve likenesses, and perhaps music in a commercial print, television, and or radio advertising campaign that coincides with the tour. In all aspects of an artist's career, it is important for the performer to control the manner in which the artist is portrayed, and the artist ordinarily will have a right to approve before use all of the artist's identifications to be used by the tour promoter and any sponsors, including the artist's personal and professional names, any nickname, likeness, including caricatures, photographs, video and film footage, voice, Twitter, X and Instagram feeds, facsimile signature, trademarks, biographical information, artwork, designs, logos, graphics, etc., and any reproduction or simulation of the foregoing. Typical sponsorship arrangements made by managers, agents, or intermediary companies will involve rights to merchandising, including t-shirts, sweatshirts, and other memorabilia imprinted with the name of the artist and the sponsor, coinciding with a tour of a separate term, with the costs and proceeds divided in a manner reflecting the strengths of the negotiating parties. The sponsor will probably insist on getting a moral clause obligation in the sponsorship agreement in order to swiftly sever ties with liability with the artist in case such performer damages their reputation or the sponsor's reputation due to bad behavior and or other reprehensible acts. Where the artist is recording pursuant to a 360 degree deal, the label may be participating actively in one or more of the merchandising or promotional capacities and will in any case likely share passively in the pool of sponsorship and merchandising revenues. The six kind of stakeholders in the live touring industry are booking agents. An artist manager and a booking agency work together to book the tour. They strike deals with the people in charge of promoting the event, which includes picking promoters that will produce the show. Example of top booking companies are William Morris Endeavor, WME, Creative Artist Agency, CIA, United Talent Agency, Paradigm Talent Agency, etc. Throughout the live music industry, the agent represents the artist. They want to arrange the tour, sell the event to local talent buyers, select a venue, and negotiate the pricing with the promoters. Decisions about the artist tour schedule, radio advertising, ticket prices, and deposits paid in advance by promoters are all made by the booking agents. And now the seventh type of... Um, Stakeholders in the live touring industry are the venues and the festivals. In the live music industry, festivals and venues provide the space and typically the base infrastructure necessary for the concerts to take place. Traditionally, promoters rent the building from the owners, then negotiate with the performers on their behalf. Music festivals are the same. Musicians can gain exposure to new audiences, fans and music business executives while making a sizable profit from participating in high profile festivals. Festival performances might be more crucial to an artist's long term success than the immediate financial benefit, especially for up and coming independent performers. It is commonly assumed that a performance venue will comply with all applicable ordinances and regulations and maintain all necessary licenses for public performances whether on the basis of physical code or public safety requirements, public health code requirements or other business licensing requirements relating to noise, alcoholic beverage sales and music public performance licenses through music publishing collecting societies such as ASCAP, BMI, CZAC in the USA, PRS in the UK and SASM in France and for neighboring rights collecting societies such as GMR in the US, PPL in the UK, SCPP and SPPF in France. However, the fact is that the venue itself may or may not be properly licensed. 
For example, nightclubs and similar venues are more likely than not to have annual blanket performance license agreements with the neighboring rights collecting societies, but larger venues that are leased to promoters for the purpose of presentations of concerts typically impose the obligation to secure the necessary public performance licenses on the promoter and of the terms of the venue lease for the shows concerned. Because the performer could be held responsible for failure to obtain such a safety related license, or the performance date could be threatened by your promoter's failure to obtain these or other licenses, the contract between the performers and the promoter should require that the promoter obtain and provide for advance review copies of all necessary licenses, including the public performance licenses. A cautionary tale is, we found to doubt, the debacle of Travis Scott's Astroworld Festival, which left eight fans dead and dozens severally injured after the crowd surged toward the stage during Scott's performance. The civil and criminal liability of Travis Scott, Live Nation and the festival venue and event coordinators were triggered via the scores of lawsuits that Astroworld victims filed. Traumatized fans alleged in their lawsuits that the co-defendants failed to provide adequate security, emergency medical services, and adequately monitor the number of people entering the venue to ensure it did not become overcrowded. While Travis Scott was found not criminally liable for the Astroworld Festival deaths, by a grand jury in June 2023, to this day, he still has to fight against and possibly settle the hundreds of lawsuits and claims for civil damages filed by hurt fans. So what are the ticketing issues in the live music industry? Let's have a look at that now that we have defined the framework and, um, and the environment via, via the seven kind of stakeholders who are necessary to form this ecosystem of the live touring industry. Well, the first ticketing issue is the very prominent anti-competitive behavior allegations made against Live Nation and Ticketmaster Post-COVID-19 pandemic, allegations of anti-competitive behavior by tour promoters and other marketing agents started to circulate and were even firmed up when the largest tour promoter, Live Nation, was sued by class action investors over anti-competitive business practices in California federal court in August 2023. Investors accused Live Nation of lying to them over alleged anti-competitive business practices, including charging exorbitant fees, bundling services, and retaliating against the news that use a ticketing service provider other than Live Nation's subsidiary Ticketmaster. Live Nation and Ticketmaster have been accused of acting in an anti-competitive way ever since the two companies merged back in 2010. In order to get regulator approval of that merger in the USA, Live Nation made a number of commitments regarding how the Live Nation touring and venue businesses would interact with Ticketmaster via a 10-year consent decree agreed with the American government's Department of Justice, the DOJ. As the consent decree was getting close to expiring in 2020, Live Nation was accused of violating some of its terms. Having looked into the allegations, the De Department of Justice began planning legal action. But a deal was struck that stopped the matter from getting to court and also extended the consent decree for another five years and a half. Since then, further allegations of misconduct have been made by Live Nation's competitors, critics, and even customers. And more recently, it emerged that a new DOJ investigation was underway. Indeed, the claim is the previously mentioned investors' lawsuit originated from the increasing attention on Live Nation's hold on the live music industry 
after the Department of Justice opened an antitrust investigation into the company in 2022. That investigation followed Ticketmaster's systems crash during the highly anticipated resale of Taylor Swift's ERAS tour tickets. In July 2023, Politico reported that that new investigation could result in new legal action being instigated by the Department of Justice against Live Nation. This DOJ probe into Ticketmaster and Live Nation, as well as the class action lawsuit filed by investors against Live Nation, are still ongoing as far as we know. Ticketmaster has also been sued by its customers who accused it of anti-competitive practices, yet again. Over the years, Ticketmaster managed to force various such legal disputes with customers to arbitration, rather than having those disputes being fought out in public in a court of law, because the ticketing firm's terms and conditions have an arbitration provision in them. Attempts by customers to argue that no one reads those terms and conditions and therefore arbitration clauses should be unenforceable in this particular case have generally been unsuccessful. However, Ticketmaster then switched its chosen arbitrator from arbitration institution Jams to a company called New Era ADR, ADR meaning Alternative Dispute Resolution. It argues that the latter company, New Era, is better equipped to deal with complaints where there are lots of concurrent complainants, which is common in the ticketing market. But not only have complainants claimed that New Era is biased in favor of the ticketing firm, but that its processes, which the customers are forced to navigate, are Kafkaesque. Quote. Also, the complainants argued in front of a California federal court that Ticketmaster, and I quote here, slid this change into terms that most customers had previously agreed to without flagging the dramatic shift being made. Therefore, in August 2023, California Judge George Yu denied the motion to compel arbitration of Sherman Act antitrust claims in the Ticketmaster case based in large part on the bellwether procedures for mass arbitration claims set out in Ticketmaster's arbitration clause. So in addition to the who's of uh, Ticketmaster and um, its parent company, Live Nation, the second largest legal challenge in the live touring industry is the fight against touting and marketing strategies and allies of touts. So while Michael Rapino, president and CEO of Live Nation, unconvincingly denies any wrongdoing and plays the card of I am a likable guy and average Joe tries to do his best in the face of adversity. The legal fight against touting and unofficial secondary ticketing platforms such as Viagogo, StubHub and LiveBooker is going on in full swing on the other side of a pond. Indeed, in March 2023, the Paris Court of Appeal upheld a first-degree judgment against Google over ticket tout ads. The French courts confirmed that Google cannot allow unofficial ticket sellers to buy their way to the top of search results for artists and shows. Secondary ticketing platforms like Viagogo and StubHub have long used Google advertising to promote tickets being sold by touts on their respective sites. In France, where the law is particularly strict when it comes to the unofficial sale of tickets to shows, essentially banning the practice, French live industry trade group Prodis, P-R-O-D-I-S-S, Prodis, went to court a few years ago to confirm that those laws meant Google should not allow secondary ticketing sites to advertise on their search engine, in particular via Google Ads in France. Campaigners like Prodis argue that because many consumers don't realize that the top results in the Google search are often there because the featured website paid for the top ranking, 
They assume those sites are the official sellers of tickets to a show. But of course, the opposite is actually true, with the official sellers often appearing lower down the page. Facing a bit of backlash as online ticket touting became even more controversial, Google did start telling secondary ticketing platforms using Google ad services that they had to better communicate the unofficial status of their sellers. However, many campaigners argue that the top search engine has not gone far enough in ensuring consumers are not confused into buying touted tickets at a higher price, which could be cancelled by a show's promoter. In 2020, the Paris Tribunal Judiciaire, judged by Google, should not allow secondary ticketing sites to advertise on their search engines in France. Google appealed the ruling, but the Paris Court of Appeal upheld the earlier judgment and also ordered Google to pay 300,000 euros in damages for failing to comply with the rules. While the French government and courts keep on viewing the French people as brain dead and a hapless lot, some fans employ pretty tough tactics to get retribution as the fans' lawsuit against Madonna, Live Nation and Barclays Center attest where two New York residents and Madonna fans sued the singer after she allegedly started her set over two hours late on the 13th of December 2023 Celebration Tour concert. So not all is well in the live ticketing industry, but it's definitely back and therefore watch the space, everyone. It was lovely to have this live webinar with you and I'll uh, be back in touch with you very soon. Bye for now.